believers, non-believers, unaffiliated believers, sort of believers, and even you think I'm a believers, welcome to the Uncensored Unprofessor. This is a podcast where we openly buck the trend of doubt and heartfully confess there is a God. Where we pursue godly wisdom and seek after Christ, it is my heart's desire to help build up your faith. As advertised all across America today, I'm going to unpack what mercy and grace are and why they're central to a Christian worldview. But first, I want to do some meta-framing, some 30,000-foot thinking with you. Just who has the indwelling Christ? I think it's a critical question. Who has the indwelling Christ? Because being a Christian is not first about adherence to a moral code. Being a Christian is not first about attending church. Being a Christian is not first about saving the planet. Who has the indwelling Christ? That's the drive, the gist, thrust, the life of the New Testament. Christian, Christian, the name itself means little Christ. Little Christs are indwelt by the eternal spirit of Christ. Little Christ tastes the living water Jesus spoke about in John 4. Little Christs are wired, are attuned to the voice of God. And no, we don't always get that perfect. Sheesh, we're finite beings. Little Christs seek to be living temples of the Holy Spirit. But yeah, we still have feet of clay. Little Christs want to do the will of their master. And again, no, we don't always get that perfect. Geesh, we're being saved by grace. Just who has the indwelling Christ? Well, true Christians, folks who are attuned to the wavelengths of Christ, they embrace, they they exude a set of values. They have sensibilities that go to the heart of the risen lion himself. And so far in this Christian worldview series, I've explored how reality is real, the infection we all struggle with, the centrality of human agency, the literate quality of Christian life, the ongoing importance of eternity and transcendence, and the constant biblical drumbeat, choose life. In all of that, there There's fruit that grows out that eventually becomes evident among those who know the indwelling Christ. Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. Frankly, if you encounter someone who poo-poos eternity or minimizes life's value or discounts the reality of sin, you have good reason to question whether they're truly indwelt by Christ. Matthew 7, 16. You will know them by their fruit. And yeah, they may be nice people, God bless nice people, but they may not have Christ Jesus living in their souls. And that, that's why I'm doing this series. I want you to be discerning, innocent as doves, wily as serpents, Matthew 10, 16. So why? Why am I taking the time to delineate a Christian worldview? Well, honestly, I'm afraid way too many people who say they follow Jesus don't, in fact, embrace a Christian worldview. They don't live through a Christian worldview. They don't evaluate life using decidedly Christian commitments. They bear no little Christ fruit. And there's there's just too much that... Well, let me put it like this. Let's make some comparisons. One way to... Do Christianity is constricted and the other is expansive. I want to compare them with you. I want to discern, I want to help you discern how millions of church folk process Christianity versus how the New Testament presents the reality of Christ for us. The constricted way, it perceives Jesus as a ticket to heaven. The expansive way sees Jesus as having brought the kingdom of God to earth. The constricted way thinks Jesus chiefly came to soothe our frazzled fears and calm our overextended emotional states. The expansive way perceives Jesus as having come to take lordship over the whole cosmos, both the spiritual heavens and the physical universe. Constricted? Jesus wants to save you from your sins. 
expansive? Jesus has recaptured reality from the devil, sin, and death. Constricted? God wants a personal relationship with you, and and of course he does. But expansive? God wants to partner with whomever will to rule and reign over his beautiful creation. The constricted view? Can you, like a country song, occasionally put a five spot in the offering plate? Expansive? Would you trust God with the whole of your financial existence and give sacrificially? Constricted, Jesus wants to be with us here and now. Expansive, Jesus wants to be with us now and into the ages of ages. Constricted, God wants you to join Him for daily devotions. Expansive view of Christianity? God wants you to join him in flooding the planet with goodness and truth and beauty and grace. Constricted? Jesus would be giddy if you'd witness to a non-believing friend. Maybe, maybe give them a flyer to the upcoming church Easter egg hunt? Expansive? Jesus would find it missionally fitting if all of your life was given over to his identity and ways. Constricted? Jesus wants you to only know peace. After all, he doesn't like tension. Expansive, Jesus wants you to give your entire existential self to his glory in times of bounty and peace and in times of friction and heat. Constricted, God is king over believers and their Bible studies, prayer groups, and worship services. Expansive, God is king over all the people of the earth and their cultural configurations. Cultures will bow their knees before the beauty of Christ. Constricted, you're infatuated with Jesus. You love how loving Jesus makes you feel. Oh, amen. I remember my first love for Jesus. In fact, I still cherish the first time Jesus and I went on a date. Ooh. Expansive, you're part of the bride of Christ, so you've enlisted for his mission for the long haul, regardless how you feel. Constricted, God would really like it if you would mentally acknowledge his existence as creator and judge. Maybe say, yes, we can, God, as you ride along to work. (laughs) Expansive, God wants to make persons into temples for his dwelling. He not only wants the external dynamics of your life, he wants your heart, your very soul, fears, dreams. So the gist of all this? Is Christianity a private affair for for you and for your feelings? Or is Christianity an entire way of living? Indwelt by Christ himself, is it an expansive, all-inclusive vision that encompasses all of reality for you? Because it was the latter that Jesus expressed both about himself and his own vision. It was the latter that transformed the planet. It's that expansive view that is known as Christianity. And that's the worldview. That's the fruit that's permeated by the holy, loving character of Christ. Follow the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the world. He is the source of everything good, true, and and beautiful. Do me a solid? Go to YouTube or Chartable or iTunes and leave a review of the UU or simply click a like button. Those reviews, those thumbs up help generate energy. And besides, your, your feedback can help frame folks' initial impressions of this podcast. Thanks. All righty then. Real quick, what are mercy and grace? Mercy, the withholding of a sentence or punishment that someone rightly deserves. Or if we're not talking about legal, judicial categories, mercy is love in action towards someone who is suffering. Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. Grace, grace is Owning the problem or extending compassion where it's not deserved. 
In resolutely theological framing, grace is God's unmerited favor toward mankind and or God's divine enablement. Now, if you need to, go back 30 seconds to hear those definitions again. I mean, that's the beauty of a podcast versus live radio. But because we love nuance here on the UU, we need to unpack both mercy and grace further. So I want to begin with wide-scale biblical framing and then move toward more specific daily examples. Do you have a pulse? Then you know the human race is in a mess. You're not a total ostrich? Then you realize there is, geesh, there's something horrid at work in life. (laughs) Honestly, ours is a massive problem. And it's such a prickly pickle that it not only affects individuals, it affects society. It it permeates and infects entire cultures. We are damaged. And we damage. Let me let me put this into an analogy for you. Over the last forty five years, the United States government, for its own gain, has irresponsibly borrowed $29 trillion. Today, our national debt is now larger than our annual gross domestic product of $22 trillion. And the threat of economic drag is looming, but the threat of economic collapse is real. Now, I guess in fantasy land it's possible that another country might repay our enormous debt. But it's impossible for our lenders to simply ignore that debt. If they did, they would go bankrupt, and a global depression would ensue, right? I mean, the banks are loaning out that money. They are on the line for it, too. It doesn't just exist invisibly somewhere. So that massive debt simply must be repaid. There's a, there's a cost to borrowing so irresponsibly. Similarly, Sin incurs a cost both inside the universe and with God. Sin activates ruination. Sin creates an enormous debt. It separates us from the Holy One. So the cost must be paid. The gulf has to be spanned. And some wonder, thinking about our mess, our debt, this lack, why didn't God simply speak the words, You are forgiven? Or why couldn't he just say, hey guys, your debt is gone? I mean, after all, he is God. Can't he do anything he wishes? Just speak forgiveness? And the answer is no. He could not simply speak forgiveness because the cost of sin and sin's ruination would not be addressed with integrity in a way that fits the universe itself or with human consciousness itself. Similarly, America's debt holders, those banks, they can't simply say, Hey, you slotchy federal politicians, we have great news for you. You don't have to repay your loans. (laughs) If they did that, the banks themselves would go broke and the global economy would shut down. Economic law demands repayment. And aware of all that, and aware of reality, God did more than say things. He took action to deal with our sin. He became man. He died in our place, was resurrected, sent his Holy Spirit. And through all of that, he dealt with sin's debt and our ruination and the the abyss between God and us. Put differently, God so respected the way he had built the universe that to solve the universe's plight, he entered into it to work through the problem. If God had simply spoken, I forgive you all, some people would rightly accuse him by saying, Hey God, that's not fair. You have to play by the rules you established. Forgiveness has a cost. You can't just say you're forgiven. Someone has to own the debt. Pay it. And that accusation, that charge would be right. So, Jesus, Son of God incarnate, He owned our gap. He took on our debt. He overcame the ruination. He atoned for our sins. 
And through all of that, God worked within the confines of the universe that he had built. And with integrity did something expensive to forgive us. All of that work of atonement involved extreme mercy and grace. Mercy? Yeah, because he took our punishment for sin. Grace? Right, because he didn't have to do it. He could have just let this all run its course into eternal disembowelment. But gracious God, he owned the mess, paid the price, and made it right. But there's still more beauty involved in God's atoning salvation. I'll I'll compare what God did for us in Christ to a story from my own life. The son of divorced parents, I grew up with a marked sense of relational insecurity. When I asked some girl out for a date and she said no, I would never ask her out again. Because insecure, I could not stand being rejected. And later, when I was in college, I met Tanya, the woman who is today my wife, and I'm quite embarrassed to report that before we were engaged to be married, I broke up with Tanya two times, and she she warned me against a third time. Wondrously, she lovingly reunited with reunited with me despite the fact despite the fact that if she had said no to me or broken up with me out of insecurity i would not likely have accepted her back graciously tanya forgave my immature impetuousness my impetuosity and and we rejoined and i'm happy to say we've been married for 36 years now and god's salvation's like that he, he did not wait for us to love him before he sought us for relationship. The Apostle Paul wrote, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8 God is so secure in his identity and his love. And God so yearns for a restored relationship with us that he took the initiative to make atonement even before we knew about him. And Jesus touched on this dynamic all the time in his ministry, but we hear him speaking about God's kingdom, and and he said to his disciples, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled, Luke 14, 23. Salvation involves not only atonement for our sins, it involves restored relationship. Holy God, he yearns to know and love us. A jealous God, he yearns for us to know him and love him and give our allegiance to him. And how did he go about doing all of that? Through extreme acts of mercy and grace. And according to the New Testament, Jesus' atoning work, his death on the cross, is the very heart of Christianity. Indeed, Jesus is the Lamb of God who offers himself so that God's peace may envelop creation. So, if there's no atonement, there's no Christianity. Period. And all of that is grace and mercy, mercy and grace. Some people today, including my last episode's atheism-inducing anti-bishop John Spong, believe the traditional doctrine of atonement through Jesus' crucifixion represents a kind of divine child abuse. The angry father vented his emotions and punished his son. Yet, to pose Christ's crucifixion that way fails to recognize that the loving Father himself was grieved about the ruination of his creation. He was grieved that his creatures had been stained by sin. And still more, to call Christ's crucifixion child abuse is to misunderstand both the problem, sin's insidious presence everywhere, and its solution. God offered himself for our restoration and paid our debt. The problem was gigantic, and it was feeding on, rusting, corroding everything. An enormous remedy was required, and in Christ, the Chosen One, anointed of the Holy Spirit, that remedy was effected. 
And in all of that, the salvation of the cosmos is entirely a work of grace. God acted first while we were all still sinners. Our our job, the, the role of our agency, is to say yes and cooperate with God's salvific work. So, to experience true joy, we human beings do not merely need our self-esteem raised or to be a re- or to be reassured that we're really nice people, as we commonly hear it put in public discourse. No, to, to know true joy, we need to be forgiven by God. Jesus was no mere man whom an angry God chastised, and the Father is not some sadistic being who delights in punishing sinners. The wrath of God in no way contradicts the holy love of God. Instead, in humble solidarity, God, second person of the Trinity, Jesus, bore our sins so that he could forgive us and restore us to himself, to one another, and even to ourselves. Jesus' death and resurrection was entirely a gift of love from the triune God. The judge became the judged, and it's all grace and mercy. God's unmerited favor. Kyrie eleison. Lord, have mercy. Thank you for your grace. Hey, you want to be subversive? Want to take action? Donate to the UU Show. You can sign up for a monthly pledge of $5, 10 or $20 called Gold, Frankincense, and Myrrh at Patreon. I, I didn't start the show to be a cultural zeitgeist eye poke but I sure have taken that focus over these last 20 months. Called by the subversive one himself, Jesus of Nazareth, to be salt and light, we have to name what is there to know it. So, me, I'd love your support. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And then look for Uncensored Unprofessor. I'd love to have you join the subversive squad. So, that was some meta-level theological biblical framing of mercy and grace for you. Now, me personally, I'm so grateful for God's grace across my life. I mean, I almost died when I'm 16, and today I mowed my lawn. What a gift. And I'm so grateful for God's ongoing grace that I named my beautiful first daughter, Carice. In in the New Testament, it's Charis, and we made that, that iota into a long E, Carice. Now, among other things, I think the name Charis is itself beautiful. It even looks beautiful in Greek. And I wanted to honor the Lord for His amazing grace in my life, so we named our blue-eyed beauty Charis. More recently, at Tanya's behest, we named our golden doodle Mercy. She's Pragers now with her first litter. Grace and Mercy? Yeah, I'd like a double portion, please. So, for those who say they're Christians, or who say they follow Jesus, but who deny the atoning work of Christ, they don't know Him. According to the New Testament, they do not have the indwelling Christ. And listen, they may be nice folks, they may even genuinely want good things for people, they may have a religious sensibility, but they don't know Christ. To deny his work is to deny him. They're not indwelled by the living spirit of Christ. Let me turn now and offer some daily corporeal, which means bodily, examples of mercy and grace. And let me clarify, it's not that I want to overlook massive or grand major examples of grace, like how military grace is to dive on top of the hand grenade in order to save your fighting buddies, right? God bless all those amazing, grand examples of grace, but the majority of our lives are engaged at the daily, menial, common levels, so let's think together about those kinds of examples. First, mercy, and this list can all be found in Scripture. Mercy is to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, give shelter to the homeless, ransom the captives, visit the sick, bury the dead. Or some spiritual works of mercy, and I found these on a Catholic webpage. I thought, a webpage, I 
I thought they were good. Instruct the ignorant. Counsel the doubtful. That's a big reason I'm doing the show. I want to counsel the doubtful. Or ad- admonish sinners. Bear wrongs patiently. Forgive offenses willingly. Comfort the afflicted. Pray for God's intervention in people's lives. I believe that I'm alive today because of the prayers of intercessory prayers, people who prayed for me. All of that, all of those are good and truly Jesus-y ways to show mercy and grace. What else? Well, right out of high school, I got a job at a Burger King. I could run the register or make fries, put burgers together, mix up shakes. I was known as a five-tool Burger King player. (laughs) And because I made it a game, I enjoyed the work. In fact, though this has nothing at all to do with mercy or grace, but one time in the afternoon, just me and one other employee were in the restaurant, the slow part of the day, and up pulled a bus of high school students. They piled inside the store and we were flooded. She ran the register and filled Cokes and I was making burgers and fries as fast as humanly possible back inside. And when I went to make a ham sandwich, I took the serrated knife, went to cut the plastic package of ham open and whoosh, in my harried state, sliced my left middle finger. It wasn't so deep I needed stitches, but the blood was flowing. <sighs> and and if you can believe it, a drop of blood fell onto the ham. What do I do? Take another minute and a half and go get another package of ham or keep working? People were waiting out front. The crush was on. Me? I wiped the blood off the ham, popped it in the microwave, and... Served it. That's gross. Oh, Burger King. (laughs) Where was I going with my Burger King anecdote? Oh, yeah. A couple months into working there, I got promoted to team leader. Now, listen, you would have taken that promotion, too. I mean, it came with a whopping 15 cent per hour raise. (laughs) Back when 15 cents actually mattered. But such lofty leadership came with monthly reviews with the store manager. And she, I, I think her name was Letty? Letty? Sheesh, that was 40 years ago. Letty would sit me down in a booth and with grace take me through my review. And she did it using the Oreo method. One slice positive and then a slice negative and then the last slice of review in the positive. Now, you and I know that the whole point of those meetings is to clarify and correct the negative thing that someone's doing, right? That I was doing. But, but because it was like an Oreo cookie, it was sandwiched between two positives, the negative didn't sting so much. Letty mixed some grace into her review. Thank you for that grace. And then years later, when I was the chair of the New Testament Theology Department, I got to hire adjuncts, people who teach one or two classes, usually one class a semester, usually freshman classes. And I would have to do their reviews. How'd I do that? Using the Oreo cookie sandwich method. A positive, a negative, and a positive. It's a simple way to mix some grace into an otherwise stinging conversation. But that's how it works with grace. It looks to soften the blow. It doesn't, holy, 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 it doesn't hide the truth, doesn't, like postmodernism, doesn't shove the truth into the closet of oblivion. But it does look for ways to soften the blow. Grace says it with a smile. Grace is mindful that the shoe could easily be on the other foot. Grace in an argument doesn't utter stinging names. Grace is aware that we're all sinners targeted by the love of God. Or, because I always loved it, here's the lyrics from U2's song, Grace, came out in 2000. 
great. I'd sing it for you, (laughs) but I don't want to do falsetto and I don't want to ruin the song. Grace, she takes the blame. She covers the shame, removes the stain. It could be her name. Grace, it's a name for a girl. It's also a thought that changed the world. And when she walks on the street, you can hear the strings. Grace finds goodness in everything. She travels outside of karma. Karma. She travels outside of karma. And when she goes to work, you can hear the strings. Grace finds beauty in everything. She carries a pearl in perfect condition. What once was hers, what once was friction, what left a mark no longer stains. Because grace makes beauty out of ugly things. Grace finds beauty in everything. Grace finds goodness in everything. Now, clearly you two were singing in light of God's grace, the the atoning grace of Christ that was given to us all to heal and restore and beautify. And I love that line, she travels outside of karma. In this case, karma is the law of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. What goes around comes around. But grace gently steps in and interrupts and breaks that cycle and says, No, I choose peace. I choose not to keep track. I choose, Holy Spirit, I choose to forgive. Grace says you don't have to be bound by your past. Grace says you don't have to be bound by those who hurt you. Grace is freedom. Oh, but for so many, grace is terrifying. Okay, grace. Grace is, again, unmerited favor. Gentleness, meekness, owning the friction in order to restore, seeking to be peaceful when everyone else is losing their minds. Grace is unmerited favor. But there's another element of grace, one that's emphasized by Charismatics and Pentecostals. Frankly, it's one welcomed by the whole Christ-confessing church, if it's not emphasized, and that is divine enablement. God's divine enablement comes through the graces, or it, it builds on that Greek word charis, the charismata, class A charismata, Charismata, teacher. The charismata are spiritual gifts. And in the scriptures, we learn that God, through Christ's Holy Spirit, gives charismata, gives graces, pastors, prophets, evangelists, missionaries, teachers, leaders, organizers, servants, healers, encouragers, prayers. I mean, we could make a long list of the ways that the Holy Spirit builds us up through divine enablement, through godly empowerment. Or, if we think of it differently, grace comes through internal, existential, emotional, physical energy surges. That famous Isaiah passage about being carried by eagles? Well, let me just quote it. Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And sometimes, often, sometimes the Lord does not, in fact, deliver us from our affliction. Sometimes He lets us go through it. But how much better is it when we go through it strengthened by the grace of the Lord? Some of the best testimonies that encourage me, some of the best stories are those where the Lord gave someone the fortitude, the inner strength to get through a rough season. And it was still hard, but the Holy Spirit kept on daily, moment by moment, helping someone get through to the resolution. I think of a season of divine enablement in my life when I was writing my dissertation. I I spent 15 months writing my dissertation. I wrote 40 hours per week. I was profoundly motivated. I think that motivation itself was the grace of the Holy Spirit. I was profoundly driven. I think the drive that I had, the energy that I had in that season, was all the work of the Holy Spirit. Energy surges. 
And a surge, I I think that's what Paul experienced when he, having asked the Lord in 2 Corinthians 12, 8, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take my affliction away from me. But God answered Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. He so treasured that power, that energy surge, that he welcomed the afflictions, the weaknesses. And he was pleased to have endured all of that so that God's grace was resting on him and in him. But you guys, I got to make one last remark. Grace is not enablement. Our postmodern culture is willing to enable every imaginable tantrum. We've been led to think that giving hugs to tantrum throwers is being gracious. But grace is not enablement. In in fact, enabling horde behavior is, is not gracious at all. There's nothing gracious about celebrating your toddler's tantrum. There's nothing gracious about treating adult tantrums like they're legitimate either. Grace is not enablement. We don't need to collapse wisdom to emphasize grace. God, the Anglican service prays, God whose nature is always to extend mercy, God never excuses sin. Grace is rooted in reality. Frankly, if grace were fantastical, if grace were whimsical, if grace laughed giddily in the face of grave evil, she wouldn't be grace, she'd be mad folly. Grace need not be enablement. Oh, Kiri eleison, Lord have mercy. And help us, stir within us by the living water of your Spirit, stir the depths of grace and mercy in Christ in a world set on vengeance and embarrassing one another. Give us your grace, work your mercy through us, because Lord, we want to shine for you. You guys, thank you so much for listening today. Please go now and turn your beautiful God-given brains on, everybody. (laughs) 